You're listening to B2B Revenue Acceleration, a podcast dedicated to helping software executives stay on the cutting edge of sales and marketing in their industry. Let's get into the show. Hi, welcome to B2B Revenue Acceleration. My name is Katrina Hoch, and I'm here today with Justin Levy, a Director of Social and Influencer Marketing at Demandbase. How are you doing today, Justin? I'm wonderful. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. So today we will be talking about B2B influencer marketing. But before we get into the details, could you just please tell us a little bit more about yourself and your career and also about your company demand base? Sure, of course. So I've been in social media for about 15 years. And over that period of time, you know, we've seen other iterations or things come into place, such as influencer marketing. I was involved with social media from the very early days when people were trying to figure out how social media could be used within business settings, right? Whether that's B2C or, or B2B. I've had the opportunity to work for several enterprise companies, Fortune 500s, to uh, lead social media for them globally. And when I came to the man base, originally my focus was on lead in social media and influencer marketing. But as time has gone on, we built up our social media function. So we have a team there full time. And that allowed me to transition to being focused solely on influencer marketing, but also taking on our presence within online communities. So these private communities that exist. So about demand base can kind of keep it very simple in that you know, our mission is to transform how B2B companies go to market. So our solutions are all about helping these companies get smarter with how they go to market. Yeah, we're quite familiar with demand base. So great, great technology there. All right. So obviously, influencer marketing is not a very new concept in the B2C world. You know, we see that a lot in in social media and Instagram and TikToks. And, you know, there is careers about being a social media influencer now that didn't exist a a while ago. But I think it's a little bit different for B2B. I think uh, lots of companies are still kind of figuring out how to utilize influencer marketing strategies for B2B brands. So I think uh, before we dive a little bit deeper, maybe you could just explain a little bit to our audience What are the basics of influencer marketing and what does it actually involve? It's really interesting when you start to dig into it because I think that's something that a lot of people think is that influencer marketing for B2B is new. And it's not. It's been around for about 10 years. Just every year, we're seeing more companies become involved in it, right? So I have friends of mine that have run B2B influencer marketing agencies for 10 years and have worked with a lot of name brands that we would all know over that period of time, right? But when you look at any new report that comes out, the bigger ones that a lot of the industry pays attention to, we see that now every year there's more money involved in it and there's more focus by companies with it being usually one of the top, you know, three or four priorities for marketing organizations. So when you look at what influencer marketing means for a B2B company, you can take a step back and think about how you are in your own life, right? Whether it's B2C, you know, you're buying from a company in your personal life or or you are doing business within your company. And there's a lack of trust, right? We don't trust companies anymore. We trust people. So we tend to want to buy from people that or buy from companies that we know people are associated with or that a trusted voice that we know is representative of that company, even if they don't work for that company. So when we work with influencers, we look for those trusted voices in those niche areas of business that we care about, or even in broader topical levels, say at the B2B marketing area. And we look to align with those people that fit our values, right? Because that's always important, but to create content that will help to be influential to their audience, but also fit with their audience, right? So 
we're not going to force fit something or only work with an influencer because they have that title or they have that audience. We want it to be a natural relationship with them or else that would come off as something fake to their audience. And not only could that hurt their brand, it could come back and hurt our brand in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And do you leverage it more to kind of elevate the brand itself or the category that you're in or both? So I think that it actually can be, and it's a really good question. I think that it can be three different ways, right? Kind of three flavors of it, if you will. Certainly the category, because as a brand, you want to be seen as the category leader in whatever category you play in, right? So that obviously helps. And then it kind of breaks down into two categories. And I think that every company wants this for the most part out of their marketing orgs, right? It's brand awareness and it's demand gen. So just depending on the campaign and the ask from the business, our campaigns will rotate either way, whether that's brand awareness, you know, we've done large uh, brand launches when we relaunched our brand last year, that was a brand awareness play. We've also done influencer campaigns around webinars to help drive leads for that webinar where we've actually had influencers as the guests, the webinar along with say a customer or something. So we tie the two together. So how would an influencer marketing campaign look like? Because like in B2C, for example, I don't know, if if you follow like a fashion person and they they wear the the bags and the, you know, all of the clothes and then they tag the company and then you, you can actually click on the link and buy the product that's right there and then. How does it work for B2B? Sure. So a lot of it is around content creation, right? So whether that's guest blog posts, podcast appearances, video, you know, video interview or short video creation around the topic, being part of a broader campaign that might be multifaceted. Those are all ways that we work with influencers. Another way that we often will do and things I'm part of right now working on is identifying people that are influential within a certain category or a persona, Mm -hmm. and then uh, working to develop, say, a top list, right? So the top 25 most influential and fill in the blank of that persona or that category. And then you take that list, and a list can be a list. We see them all over the place. But you utilize that list to either build a new relationship or to reinforce an existing relationship by personalized outreach, you know, providing them, say, with a social card that they can easily share on social media to recognize that being included in that list. And then you don't stop there. You can go one step further and develop an ebook on that topical area. So reach out to them again and ask for their feedback on a certain question or area that they may have a strong opinion in. So you can develop this ebook and then you go back out to them with their quote so that they can easily share their quote now along with more suggested social media. And from then, now you have a relationship. So you can offer them other areas that are of benefit to them, right? Because influencer marketing, where I think a lot of brands get it wrong, is they see it as a one-way street, right? We want you... Mr. or Mrs. Social Influencer to do this for us. Either we pay you or we don't. That's a different topic. But we want you to do this for us. As opposed to a two-way street, something that benefits both the influencer and the brand. So if they're given opportunities to guest post, to be on a podcast, to have these social cards and say that I was involved in an ebook with the man base and here's my contribution. And by the way, I got to be in this ebook with these other brands or these other influential people. That not only helps us with this larger integrated campaign, but it also benefits that influencer. It's kind of finding 
whatever makes them tick, you know, because some influencers, they would be, yeah, pay me some money and I'll say whatever you want. And others will be actually, they want to grow their personal brand to be seen even more as big influencers. And then yeah. that's kind of the trade on their side. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. you have to, you know, there are these categories of influencers, whether you're a celebrity, which are the easy ones, B2C, you know, those are more well-known, right? And they are true celebrities, athletes, what have you. But then you do have macro, micro, niche. You have all these different levels that are based on the reach of that influencer. Mm -hmm. So when you develop a campaign, you might look at that and say, okay, we want for the brand awareness piece of it, we want to work with broader micro or macro influencers because they have this huge reach. And therefore, we will pay them and be and they'll create whatever content format is best for them, right? If they create a lot of video content, you're not going to try to force fit them. You're going to work in a format that they are used to working. But then to get down to that category level, you might go work with a niche influencer to now drive that home. So now you're looking at this broader, say, B2B marketing. You have these sets of influencers you're working with on this campaign. But now at a niche level, you might work with, say, ABM influencers that have that really kind of niche community that listen and pay attention to all topics ABM related. That's cool. And how do you actually go about identifying the right influences? And I know you mentioned about sometimes having like lists and rankings and stuff. How do you pin down the right ones and how do you go about initiating that collaboration? So in B2B, I think it's naturally known that the primary social network is LinkedIn, right? For most of us, that's where we develop our influence or have our, you know, for those that aren't in that business, you know, at least you have your social resume of sorts on LinkedIn and maybe or maybe not on other social networks. There are plenty of B2B influencers on TikTok these days in Twitter and, and what have you. But when we go look for influencers, we want to look for those that have a, a certain amount of reach, you know, naturally that you are looking at that engagement. So both active and passive engagement. And what I mean by that passive is more, are you just liking a post and moving on, right? Active is, are you taking an action? Are you commenting on it? Are you sharing it? Things of that nature. And then what is their involvement in that topical area, right? So it doesn't help. You could have 100,000 followers, but if all you're doing is reposting your company content with no context and no original voice, that's not influence. If you just went on the total number of followers, sure, they'd be an influencer. Great, go reach out to them. But they're not an influencer in that space. They might be just by title. Right. Yeah. So, and then either they are already one of our contacts and we can reach out to them. They might be mutual contact of someone else. So we can, you know, utilize that. And a lot of times it's sending them a private message. You know, I reach out to a ton of people via private message, say on LinkedIn and recognize who they are and, and ask if we can talk via email. And usually that's, successful because there's a mutual respect there yeah so you go outbound <laughs> show yes. say. yeah pretty that's much cool. yes there is also like agencies out there that do that so could companies also contact agencies instead of them doing it itself or oh absolutely and at certain times we've worked with agencies you know when we did the brand launch last year because of how large of a project and how detailed of a project that was for us we worked with an agency and then there are also nowadays vendors you know tools that you can utilize saas tools to help you identify influencers utilize their professional services for outreach and reporting and dashboards and things of that nature. So as the industry has matured, it's certainly not manual, 
in the sense that you can use agencies or SaaS vendors. The one difficult part right now for anyone that's involved within B2B is that LinkedIn's API is closed. So it's not the same as the Twitter Firehose. Twitter Firehose, you can use mostly any tool that exists, whether it's a social media management system, it's an influencer tool or what have you, and you can get all the data from them. Influencer marketing in that respect, as long as it's not Twitter, if it's LinkedIn, you or your agency or the professional services at the tool that you're using has to literally go into LinkedIn and create these lists and do that research or have that and save it, right? We obviously have from all of our campaigns, we have all those people, but we have them in a spreadsheet that we have to maintain. Your your research makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. You also touched on how do you guys leverage communities? So like Pavilion and all of those. And how do you go about that? Because obviously you need to be careful the way you position because you can't pitch your product and stuff like that. So how do you leverage these communities from an influencer perspective? Yeah. So see it as twofold, really, right? On the employee side, so on the internal side, we encourage our employees to be involved in these communities. It helps with their personal branding. It helps with their networking. It helps them to just be active in the specific areas of the business that they're involved in, right? So there are the larger ones that are more well-known, obviously, like you said, a pavilion, but then there are more niche ones depending on where you sit. So there are marketing ones, there are sales-focused ones, even down within, say, marketing there's Mo Pros, which is for market and operations folks. So now you, you even get to a smaller community or more tight knit one. So certainly helping employees understand that they should be part of these communities and that it can help them help their career. But one area that we focus on day to day is monitoring for any mentions of our brand, our competitors, and areas that our solutions can help. So say intent data or technographics or ABM. And then we have a deep partnership with our customer marketing team where they will work with our customers that are members of these communities to go in and actively be part of those conversations. And now, because we've done this for about a year, a lot of our customers actually, either before we get to it, they will go see the conversation, just jump into it naturally and send us a a message and say, hey, listen, I just answered this question so that you know, right? So they become your advocates. Exactly. They become your, beyond anything else they're doing elsewhere that customer marketing is working with them on, you know, video testimonials or speaking opportunities or what have you. They're advocates within private communities because it, once again, no one trusts companies, they trust people. Yeah. So within these communities, it's a lot better for a customer to say, I evaluated all these tools and my company settled on the man base because they do have the best intent data or the best ABM data or the best combined solution, right? If you want to talk, send me a message. We see a lot of that. Yeah, and it does help to build a lot of trust, doesn't it? Absolutely. So do you do you actively go about then incentivizing the customers that do that? Or do you have some sort of kind of referral or advocacy programs in place with the customers? Or is that something that you let kind of flow more naturally so it doesn't come across as people are faking what you're saying or something? <laughs> or like, they, it sounds like they're being paid to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And that's something that our customer marketing team handles. But with our customer marketing org, they have a broader strategy in it. So it's not an incentivization uh, or program just for actively answering a question within a community, right? So it's not, hey, Mr. Mrs. Customer, thank you. Here's a $25 gift card, right? Or something like that you see all the time if you do a, a review or you you know, execute this, you know, NPS score, we'll send you a gift card type thing. 
they have a whole point system and we have a customer community. So there's all sorts of things that customers can earn rewards and points for, right? And not just being active externally, it can be something as simple as introducing yourself to the community if you're a new customer within there, right? So it's not something specific to private communities. Also, it's certainly helpful for our customers when they're in there because similar to our employees, it helps them with their personal brands and it helps them when they go back to their company to showcase how they are active and the benefit for them to be active there, it naturally builds other opportunities, right? For the ones that we haven't worked on customer case studies with, sometimes that opens doors to do that and other strategies certainly that our team has in place. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense. And I think the last point that I wanted to touch on, which obviously is really important, is around the measurement. How do you measure success of an influencer marketing strategy? Absolutely. So certainly we look at some of what you would expect, right? Reach and say engagement. So when we look at those two, I always want to look at it at both the brand and the influencer levels, right? And I think that a lot of folks forget about the brand reach and engagement of these programs because naturally we're going to share this through our brand channels. So it's a disservice if we don't measure that because the influencer campaign is multifaceted. So yeah. we want to know how each influencer you know, produced or what their metrics are, but also what the total is for all the, like for the whole external influencer campaign, as well as our brand's involvement in that, if you will. Paid campaigns, another metric that we care about is called CPE. That's cost per engagement. And why I like to do that is that the influencer industry is wild, wild west when it comes to pricing. And so you could charge one thing and I could charge something different. You And it's all subjective, right? So you could think that you're very influential. And so you're going to charge X for the same thing that I think I'm working on building influence. And so I'm going to charge something different. CPE is a way to baseline all of that and measure it, right? Because now we're saying we paid both of you X amount and what was the result on an engagement basis. So now I can look back and say, I paid you $10,000 and I got 50 engagements. There's one number. and Or I paid the next person $1,000 and I got 500 engagements. Now that's measured. It's baselined. It's in black and white who yeah. performed better. Of course, there's other factors. Was it video? Was it audio? I mean, you have to take those into consideration, but as a hard metric, you now have that. And then also, I think what's always important with all of our campaigns is that we measure traffic back to our website. And we've had multiple campaigns that within the first week or two weeks or so of launching, they're within the first 10 pages on our website, including the homepage and our website. Now, of course, like most companies have, has hundreds and hundreds of pages on it. That's important, right? That proves your campaign. You yeah. know, if you had this reach and you had this engagement and you work with X number of influencers and you're one of the top five most visited pages along with the homepage, which always is going to be number one for any company. That's a great metric to have. 100%. So do you use like, do you build specific landing pages and links to direct to that campaign to be able to measure that? It depends mm -hmm. naturally, right? So say with the top list, it'll be a blog post. The blog post is where the top list is announced or located. If it's the ebook, Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a landing page built for that ebook for the campaign that we did last year with the brand launch. It was a major lift. So we had a very custom landing page built for it with calls to action to download other assets. And there was a blog post. So, you know, there are these different aspects to it. But at the end of 
the day, there's always a landing page of sorts, even if it's the blog post, right? We're direct in traffic somewhere. I found interesting the CPE metric that mentioned. Is there any kind of benchmark or what sort of CPE you should aim for? Or does it vary a lot by industry? I think it varies by every company, by budget, by industry, because every company's budget is going to be different, right? Yeah. So it's it's unfair, I think, to a company to say your CPE should be X or the benchmark is Y. Because if I have $10,000 and you have $100,000 to play with, you have a different level of influencer you can go work with. Yeah. You can either go all in with one you can spread that money across 20. You yeah. know, it, you will see benchmarks out there. I don't necessarily pay attention to them per se because I care about what ours are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the E in engagement could be a click or a comment or a share or a website visit. So it, it depends what engagement is, right? The engagement would be on the social channel. Okay. So all social engagements is really what it is. So like shares, comments. Yeah. The clicks is something else that I personally measure because that's sitting in the social channel and go into our website. So from there, like any web business, you have all the web metrics. You know, yeah. you have your visits, you have your bounce rate, you have your time on page, and you can look at the comparisons versus other pages. Interesting. Love it. Love it. That is something that we are looking into. So yeah, really appreciate you. You kind of sharing all your knowledge there. So um, thank you so much for that. Right. So if anybody wants to connect with you and maybe learn more about influencer marketing or connect with yourself or learn more about demand base, what's the best way to get hold of you, Justin? It's really simple. Justin Levy. So J-U-S-T-I-N and L-E-V as in Victor Y on any social network. <laughs> and demand base on every social network. So we try to keep it simple. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much once again. It was uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to B2B Revenue Acceleration. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.